Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. I'm Karen Jacobs. I'm the director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Sonoma State, and I'm very happy to see all of you here for our fall 2019 course preview. How many of you were here over the summer? Okay. This summer, we averaged 250 students per class. This is what happens when you give classes away. <laughs> if you are here today because you think the fall is also free, I'm sorry to tell you, it is not. However, it will be of equal quality, and we're glad to have all of you back and have new students with us, many of you who were introduced to the program over the summer. We did start a partnership with our alumni office, and I want to ask if there are any Sonoma State alumni in the house today. Oh, wonderful. Terrific. We sent out a lot of letters introducing you to the program, and we're, we're happy to have a representation of our alumni folks here today. I also like to ask how many are here for the first time with the OLLI program today. Great, wonderful, and by the same token, how many of you were here, as we like to say, in the beginning, back in 2001? I see a few hands, and how many have been with us for 10 years? Many hands, wonderful. Well, this is a, a true community, and for those of you who are new to OLLI, you will see that we are loyalists, we are uh, a congenial group, and we're delighted to build the group as we move forward toward our 20th year, which, believe it or not, is coming up a year from now. Um, I did want to make a couple of quick announcements, and then we have a lot of people to get to who you really came to listen to today. For those of you who understood earlier in the year that we were moving the program off campus, we have been given a reprieve to stay on campus for one more year. The move was precipitated by a large construction project to one of our largest, oldest buildings. And uh, things were moved back enough sufficiently, and we advocated for one more year here on the campus. So our classes will take place for the entire coming academic year in Cooperage, which has been our home since the beginning. So uh, just to clarify that, we will be in Cooperage Hall all year. Um, I agree with you. <laughs> it is uh, by design, this has been a campus-based program. Bernard Osher intended for it to be affiliated with the university, and that's part of its integrity, and I'm very glad that we'll be here for the foreseeable future. Um, I also want to mention that this Friday will be a second preview at the Glazer Center campus, which is our satellite in downtown Santa Rosa. And we have uh, four instructors who will be teaching there on Fridays. So if you'd like to join us to hear about those classes, uh, there will also be free food on Friday. Somebody said they came for the free food today, and I thought, well, then they would have left by now. But clearly, you're here for another reason. I'm delighted to see over 200 of you here today. We made 200 agendas. They're all gone. Um, so this is a terrific turnout. And we have what I believe to be one of our best lineups this fall. So without any further ado, I will introduce our first speaker, who unfortunately is here via video. He is on the beach in Hawaii, and I tried to compete with that, but somehow free bagels didn't quite get me there. So uh, we will welcome Mike Arnold via video, and then we will move through, through the agenda, uh, as you see, in order of the catalog presentation. So thank you all again for being here, and I introduce Mike Arnold. I'm Mike Arnold, and I'm going to be teaching the course in the fall entitled Trump's Non-Economic Policies. The class meets on Mondays at 9.30 a.m. beginning September 9th. This course has three parts to it. 
The first part is we're going to be looking at the Republican tax bill that was passed in December 2017. That tax bill was a very big deal. It changed personal income tax rates, it changed corporate income tax rates, and changed many of the rules invol involving some of the details in the tax law. Uh, so far, it's had some beneficial effects on the economy, uh, but the consequences of that tax bill have yet to be identified, but we will be talking about all of this in the first, first half of the course. In the second half of the course, we're going to be talking about Trump's tariff policies. Tariff policies are very unpopular with economists, and I'll be explaining why it is that most economists believe there are huge advantages to economies from free trade and restrictions on free trade come at a great cost and we'll be discussing how those have played out under the Trump administration. The last lecture of the course is going to focus on the issues associated with economics and the environment. There's a lot of people out there that think there's a conflict between economics and the environment. There isn't. There hasn't been and there's not going to be. However, the Trump policies can be evaluated from the perspective of economics and that lecture is going to focus in on how economists think about environmental policies. I hope you will all come to the class. It, again, it's Mondays at 9.30 a.m. How many of you have taken a class with Mike? And I can assure you he's a better instructor than he is a videographer. <laughs> but um, it would be well worth your time to come and see that for yourself. Um, all right, so moving on from Mike, um, we move to somebody who uh, is as animated in person as he would be on video or in any other format somebody who was no stranger to the program. How many of you have taken classes with Pete Elman? All right. How many of you would take another class with Pete Elman? All right. So for those of you who don't know him yet, you are in for a real treat. He has people dancing in the aisles from minute one. Please join me in welcoming Pete Elman. Thanks, Karen. And uh, Thank you all for coming today. Uh, as you can see, this course I'm going to teach in the fall starting September 9th, Monday afternoons in the Cooperage, is all about singers. But it's not just about singers. Throughout the rich, long arc of popular music, there's always existed the great singer, the individual who elevates the great song to another dimension, a place where we, as listeners, are thrilled and inspired for the rest of our lives as we listen to that work. This course is going to cover the lives and careers of six legendary rock and R&B singers from the period 1955 to the present. Six American giants whose work has embodied the rich legacy of American roots music. Although all of them are known as songwriters and performers, they made their mark as vocalists who could rock our socks off one minute, while with the next breath cajole the sweetest melodies from the material they so passionately tackled. These six classes will be presented as a cultural and musical journey through the amazing lives and work of these artists when they were at the forefront, and still are in some cases, of popular music. The course will do this through several media, lectures, audio CDs, selected videos, photographs, and what's different about my class that most of you have taken my class know, of course, I like to use live music in the class. I play piano, guitar, and sing. I'm going to have a wonderful guest uh, come one of the weeks to help me. We'll play examples from each artist to perform in class. And what's unique about this class, I hope, is that we're going to delve into what makes these great singers' vocal styles so distinctive, so wonderful, and so inspiring. Take a look at the six singers we're going to do. Is there anybody who doesn't recognize any one of those six singers? That's all right. I mean, if I had had a couple of drinks at 9 in the morning, I might not recognize them either.
Those are the singers with some of their more common nicknames. So in case somebody wasn't sure, that's who they are. Week one, Ray Charles, the genius. Many musicians possess elements of genius, but only one, the great Ray Charles, so completely embodies the term that it was bestowed upon him as a nickname. Ray displayed his genius by combining elements of gospel and blues into a fervent, exuberant style that would come to be known as soul music. While recording for Atlantic Records during the 1950s, this innovative singer, pianist, songwriter, and band leader broke down the barriers between sacred and secular music. When we think of the greatest singers ever, his name is always mentioned. Week two, the incomparable Sam Cooke. Sam Cooke was nicknamed the King of Soul. He was a man who the great Jerry Wexler once described as the best singer of all time. That may be debatable, but there's one thing that certainly isn't. Sam was the first singer to seamlessly and successfully blend gospel, blues, and soul into great popular music. His records are timeless, his voice a velvety vehicle that combined the inventive phrasing and restraint of a jazz singer with the emotion of gospel and the melodies of pop. Although he died tragically 35 years ago, he left a body of work that will last forever. The next week, Tina Turner, a force of nature, the queen of rock and roll. The most commercially successful female rock star in the world, although she's somewhat retired now. Her sultry, powerful voice, her incredible dancing, her time-tested beauty, and her unforgettable tale all contribute to her legendary status. Her personal story from rags to riches and that of overcoming spousal abuse is matched only by her ability to reinvent herself when she was 40 years old as an international superstar solo act. With 60 years in the music business, if one looks objectively at her body of work with and after her late husband, Ike Turner, she is arguably the greatest female and rock and roll singer of our time. Next week, week four, a man whose nickname was The Voice that kind of says all you need to know, but there's so much more to Roy Orbison. He was perhaps the only rock star of his or any era that wore sunglasses not to look cool, but to cover up his plain, nerdy features. It made no difference because for Roy, it was all about the voice. That gorgeous three octave pitch perfect vehicle, a cross between a baritone and a tenor that could growl down low and soar up high. His songs were operatic three minute epics that defied all traditional song form and rock and roll instrumentation. Songs that featured full blown string sections and angelic choirs. Week five is somebody who's lived in Marin County for the last two decades and is very much still a performer and a recording artist. Soul Grace and the Blues. Is there anybody cooler than Bonnie Raitt? I first saw Bonnie in a coffee house in Cambridge, Massachusetts when I was 19 in college. I was just back from a month playing music in the island of Trinidad and I wandered into this coffee shop and I heard this voice out in the street. And I swear, I thought it was two people. I thought it was maybe like an old black Delta blues musician playing the guitar, accompanied by a young black woman singing the blues. But when I walked in, it was a 21-year-old redhead, daughter of a famous musical theater singer and actor, John Raitt, who was up on stage laying down the meanest nastiest, most low-down blues I had ever seen in my life. The last week, Aretha Franklin, the late, great Aretha Franklin, who passed away a little bit over a year ago. She's not only the definitive female soul singer of the 60s, she's also one of the most influential, important voices in pop history. She fused the gospel music she grew up with in her daddy's church in Detroit with the sensuality and power of rhythm and blues, the innovation of jazz and the precision of pop. From her childhood idol, Sam Cooke, 
from Otis Redding, from Ray Charles. And even those greats could not match her power, her versatility, and her range. She combined incredible natural talent with hard, studious work with an amazing natural voice. Her career spanned six decades. And during that time, she built an amazing catalog of recorded music and thrilled millions with a voice that combines the passion and soul of that gospel of her youth with the pop soul she came, came of age with. So I hope you guys can find a couple hours on those Mondays to come because I think you'll get a lot out of it and hopefully get inspired. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. I don't know that my boss is still in the room, but I'm coming to the Bonnie Raitt Day, and there's no question about that. Um, all right, moving on to our next speaker. Um, many of you know him from a course that he taught uh, about a year ago, Stephen, um, which had more to do with the brain, but his uh, education and the first half of his career are rooted in the world of computers. And he is going to share with us uh, the history of computers from Abacus to the iPhone and I'm sure many chapters in between. So please join me in welcoming Stephen Campbell. I am so excited to be here again. The reason is because you all. Can I do that? Okay. Is this all right? Good. Okay. <gasps> The reason is because you guys remember things. So let's go back to 1974, okay? Do you remember what happened in 1974? Washington, D.C., everyone was, ex was just attached to their television sets. Starts with W. Watergate, okay? Watergate and Nixon uh, resigned. Remember that? Remember the um, gas shortages and the lines we had to wait in? That's why you love, I love you guys. You remember all this stuff, okay? Okay? That was the year that the American Football League was founded, but more importantly, that was the year that an unassuming little magazine showed up called Popular Electronics, and that's where they advertised the Altair 8800. This is what it looked like. This is what you got. You got a computer kit that you had to solder together yourself, and it usually didn't work till about the third try. But people in America went nuts about the thought of having their own computer. Here's the problem, though. What's missing? No monitor. What else? Keyboard. No keyboard. What else? No mouse. What else? No printer. None of those. But they went nuts at the thought of having their own computers. So back east, a guy saw this, grabbed it off the shelf, went to his best friend who, lived, who was working, who was actually a student at Stanford University, and said, they need an operating system for this. So his best friend moved down to Albuquerque, New Mexico, with a bunch of his buddies in a sleazy little motel, and they developed the first operating system on paper tape. And those two guys were... Paul Allen and Bill Gates, okay? Okay, back west, they made it, and nobody knew what to do with it. Because here's the problem. To make this thing work, the top are lights, and you've got switches. Actually, the first two are lights, and the, the next two are switches. If you want to add it 4 plus 3, you had to need to know the binary eight-digit number for 4, the binary eight-digit number for plus, the number for three, the plus for equal, and if the third light showed up, <gasps> it worked, and people went crazy, but nobody knew what to do with their new toy. There was nothing they could do with it, so they began forming clubs, and the most popular club was the Homebrew Computing Club, which met every Wednesday night at Harvard University, I'm sorry, Stanford University. There were a couple of teenagers who kept showing up. They could not afford the Altair because it cost $479 back when gasoline was 55 cents a, a, a gallon. And today's dollar, that's around $3,000, so they couldn't afford it. So what he did is he made his own computers on wooden frames. He was later called the Mozart of computer design. Another guy saw this and said, we can make money. They both had the same name. Who were they? Steve Wozniak? Steve Jobs. 
So you might see that the Altair 8800 was where Microsoft and Apple were born. Whoa. So what we're going to learn together is we're going to learn how it all began. Back, and I love this. This is the founder. He said, when we were young, we were too young to know it couldn't be done. There you go. So we're going to look at all sorts of things. We're going to look at, basically it starts with stones and calculates. Calculate came up to the word of calculations, okay? We'll also look at the first computer. There it is, 150 BC. When I was the first computer, but it could count and compare, okay? And then you have the loom. That was where um, the operating system began working, and they used cards back then. Remember cards? Remember, I love you guys. You know all this stuff. Okay, okay. Then Ada Lovelace, she was the first brilliant computer programmer. Whoa, and she was the daughter of Lord Byron. Okay. So, from the abacus to the iPhone involves 200 stories. And we're going to look at all 200 of them and fit them all together in one amazing puzzle to how we got together. And by the time we're done, you are going to understand how computers work. Believe it or not, you're going to understand binary language. That's really hard to believe, but watch. You really, really are, and that's really neat. Another thing we're going to learn is we're going to look at the context of what we're talking about. So, example, 1836. What happened in 1836? Think Texas. Texas, remember the Alamo. In 1836 was also the first year that the first telegraph was patented by George Morse. Was it Morse? George Morse, I think. Who was Samuel Morse? Thank you very much. Sam, I knew that was incorrect. Okay. And finally, we're going to look at how geniuses think. Now, people say, well, Steve, I'm not a genius. Yes, but you can learn how to think like one. And then we'll learn, we'll start with what I call new ways of thinking. And the whole basis of it will be, and we talked about this last year, is that your brain believes everything you tell it. So when you say, I can't think like a genius, what would your brain say, everyone? Okay, you're right, you can't. But when you say, I can think like a genius, what does your brain say to that? Okay, and then becomes obsessed with finding ways to do it. Wow. Now, I am flying off to Ireland. Thank you very much. All right, so we're moving on. Uh, you might notice we put this on the same day as a course on artificial intelligence and robotics, thinking they went together rather well. But in fact, the instructor of this second course comes to us out of the Department of Philosophy here at Sonoma State. So I think we'll get a very different reference point. Uh, this is in keeping with my tradition of trying to poach wonderful Sonoma State faculty for the OLLI program. And uh, we're delighted that he is now joining us. Please join me in welcoming John Sullins. All right, thank you. Um, so Steve's class looks like it's going to be amazing. And hopefully if you take that class, you can stick around and we can talk about the vast implications of what uh, computers have brought to us. So um, since I'm new to the program, I'll just introduce myself a little bit. My name is John Sullins, and I've taught here at Sonoma State for, uh, it'll be 16 years this year. And um, my degree is in philosophy, computers, and cognitive science. And I did some time as a uh, junior researcher at Xerox Palo Alto Research Laboratory as well in the 90s. So. Um, what are we talk, gonna talk about in this class? Of course, the end of humanity. <laughs> so this is what the, the homebrew computer club has brought us to. Um, the they, uh, genius, genius level thinking has brought us to the point of, um, of extinction, maybe? Maybe not. So, we're going to talk about how the AI apocalypse is happening, and it's, um, 
it's a lot different than what the movies would have us, you know, the robot crushing the skull kind of thing that you see in every movie. We're actually just sort of being um, uh, covered by AI. Uh, we drape it all over our bodies, like this thing and, um, and the phone, right, and the, all the computers we have around us. AI is creeping into every aspect of our life, and we need to start thinking about what that means for us and for the future. So in each, uh, each week, we're going to address a, an important topic that, um, that has uh, something to do with uh, how things are changing. So in our first week, yeah, we're going to look at just what is artificial intelligence, um, what kind of technologies are out there, where are we going with this, and um, realize that it's not necessarily something that we have to fear. It's actually filled with a lot of um, promise as well. And um, we're going to take a look at that and try to disentangle the, um, the uh, hype from the reality uh, I probably the main reason I got into this topic was as a little child, my dad took me to see 2001, A Space Odyssey, and um, it blew my mind, like literally blew my mind. And a as a little kid, I was, I was thinking, well, God, 2000, I'm going to be like an adult then, and I better know about how computers work and all this stuff. So I got really excited about it. And, um, and when 2000 came, of course, we didn't have talking computers, and we didn't have the kind of space technology in that film. And so since 2000, I've been asking myself this question, like why, what, what's the problem? Like how come we don't have this? So we're gonna talk about this, the promise and peril of AI and, um, and the hype. Uh, week two, we'll take a look at some of the work that I do. So I work with, um, I've worked with, did some consulting for NATO and DARPA and different organizations. And we're gonna dig into some of that work that I do. Um, all about AI and robotics in the realm of warfare. Um, this is where things are, um, are getting really weird and creepy, and um, I think you'll find that pretty interesting. So we'll start with the scary stuff, then we'll move ahead. Um, week three, we'll look at the advent of autonomous vehicles, which um, you all might be finding really interesting. I mean, I am. I, can't, I, would, I would love to just, like, sleep all the way to my class, and um, it really saved me a lot. Um, so is this possible? I mean, really, are we going to develop this kind of technology where you literally just go to sleep and show up at, at your job? Um, so I've done some interesting work with, um, with Nissan and, again, with uh, SRI and, and DARPA um, about um, autonomous vehicles. And um, so I'm going to uh, talk about that work and some of the research that's being done in that world on that week. Uh, week four, we're going to talk about the um, really strange world of elder care robotics. So um, imagine a future in a fa fairly near term future where um, your family and your friends and your kids can completely ignore you. and. Um, and you can, but you can stay in your house, right? You can stay in your house, um, and you're going to be interacting with uh, machines like this um, day in and day out, and it's going to make your life, um, I don't know, is it going to make it a living hell, or is it going to make it uh, a lot better? Um, this is something that we need to talk about. Uh, as we have a, a rapidly aging population, um, and, and I guess not enough people to take care of them, or not enough people that want to take care of them, we have a, um, a, a really massive uh, new business starting, which is elder care robotics, filled with a lot of ethical problems and issues that we have to discuss. So that's what we'll be doing on week four. Uh, week five, um, this is really an interesting question, right? Can you trust Alexa? Um, can you trust these things? Uh, I'm, I'm giving this talk right now, and my iPhone's listening to it, and um, what can it do with it? Uh, what, 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 are the, what are they doing with this stuff? So uh, we're going to get into what things like these uh, ubiquitously on um, uh, computer terminals are and what they can and can't do, um, talk about the interesting um, uh, history of uh, talking computers, and then ask the really the most important question, which is why isn't this thing as smart as Hal 
Um, it's really kind of stupid when it comes when it comes down to it. So um, a lot of hype and a lot of but a lot of promise and a lot of creepy uh, privacy concerns when it comes to things like Alexa. Okay, um, on week six. Um, we're going to kind of sum things up and try to figure out just exactly where we want AI to go. So this is kind of the, the, the important piece of the class is that I don't want to leave AI up to the geniuses because the geniuses often have, um, have a bad idea about what, what the, where we should go as a society. I want more, more people getting involved in um, the development of AI and how, um, and we're going to talk about how people can have a voice in um, R&D. Um, so that's a lot of what I do currently is work with uh, Silicon Valley corporations and try to figure out ways to in increase the dialogue with, um, with more than just the engineers and the designers of these machines and make them something that we actually want in our lives and not just something that um, we're going to have to be fearful or mistrustful of. Okay, so um, uh, oh, and the last thing is we will talk about how we can develop things, um, machines that will actually start to think and act on ethical um, ideas. That, that's my work in particular is um, helping to design what I call artificial moral agents, um, which are um, really interesting entities that may, may exist one day and um, would, know, would, know, would be able to... Uh, make decisions in an ethical way, in ways that Alexa is now completely incapable of making those decisions. Okay, so that's me, and um, if you take uh, both of our classes, you will know so much you could teach next year's class. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. Okay, so our next presenter, could not be here in person. This is our last um, in absentia video, and she's a slightly more accomplished videographer than our first speaker, um, and uh, not a stranger to many of you. How many of you have taken a class with Nicole Myers? Very good. She is a resident geologist here on faculty at Sonoma State and a delightful human being, which I think will come across in this video. So I give you Nicole Myers. Good morning. My name is Nicole Myers. This semester I will be presenting Geology of California, the story of a growing continent on Wednesday mornings at 9.30 a.m. California exists on the western edge of the North American continent and contains geologic evidence of approximately 1 billion years of continental evolution. Much of California is relatively young, only a few hundred million years old. And geologists, like myself, study the rocks exposed at the surface and create maps, like the generalized geologic map of California on the right side of the screen. These maps expose patterns that help us understand how the land formed. The seven colors on the map represent seven suites of rocks that each form in a unique way and lend clues about how California has been pieced together over millions of years. For example, all the red and orange on the map represent volcanic rocks, some of which erupted and some of which cooled deep within the earth. Geomorphologists divide California into 11 provinces, each with a different geologic history. On this geo tour, we will go back hundreds of millions of years into the past and millions of years into the future to better understand how and where volcanoes erupt why mountains are rising and eroding, where faults exist and how they cause valleys to form adjacent to the mountains they raise. We will explore the deserts that form in the deep valleys cut off from the ocean's moisture, the rivers that carve into mountains and flood the valleys below, and the inland seas of the past that once filled modern day valleys like the Great Valley. We will also explore how climate change has morphed the environment and how humans are contributing to the ongoing evolution of the state. California has many faces, and all are the result of the constant motion of tectonic plates. In the video in the upper left of the screen, the red lines represent the boundaries of the plates that are always in motion, moving towards each other, away from each other, and sliding past each other. 
The size and shape of the plates change, thereby changing the shape of the surface of planet Earth and creating unique environments. California is home to many famous destinations that draw people from around the world. By the end of this course, we will have gained an understanding of the unique geologic processes that formed Death Valley and the Mojave Desert. We will investigate the geologic transition that created the San Andreas Fault, a relatively young tectonic boundary. We will explore the volcanic evolution of the Sierra Nevada mountain range that forms the backbone of California and includes Yosemite and Lake Tahoe. And we will delve into the active volcanoes that surround us, like Mount Shasta, Mount Lassen, and Mount Kanoktai. So join me this fall as we explore the deep history of California. The first week I will cover converging tectonic plates and how they formed the majority of the rocks within California. On week two, I will focus on the San Andreas Fault, how it formed, and the earthquakes caused by its constant motion. During week three, I will dig through the ancient valleys that store layers of deposited sediment that geologists can read like chapters in a book and use to interpret the evolution of the land. On week four, I will focus on glaciers and rivers that carve the surface of the state, creating deep valleys like Yosemite. During week five, we will investigate the human influences on the climate and hydrology and how mining practices continue to shape the environment we live in. And finally, on week six, we will look into the future and consider what changes are geologically and climatologically inevitable. And we will consider what humans can actually change. I hope you will take this journey with me this semester on Wednesday mornings to tour California and the evolution of North America through the depths of time. Have a wonderful rest of your day. I'll tell her that you applauded. <laughs> okay, so our next speaker, um, has taught for us uh, once before. He is a docent at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and a wealth of information on art history. And I thought about his class this morning before I left the house as I was looking in the mirror <laughs> because he came up with such a clever title. How does my hair look? The history of portraiture and self-portraiture in art and photography. Please join me in welcoming Charlie Goldberg. How does my hair look? So, well, uh, thank you for um, coming here today to listen to these presentations. This is my second time teaching an Ollie course. I had the pleasure of doing it last year. I had such a great time doing it, and I see a lot of familiar faces from the photography class that I gave um, last time. This time I'm gonna talk about portraiture and self-portraiture. And I don't know, when I was a young man, I just really didn't care about portraits at all. If I would typically go into a museum, my first question was, you know, where are the Monet water lilies? And I just would walk right by the portrait rooms. But as I learned more and more about art, I, I started really getting a fascination with portraits, and in particular, self-portraits. And we'll, we'll talk about that <clears throat> in just a minute. But I want you to think about, in your own mind, if I say the word portrait, what portrait, <clears throat> excuse me, comes to your mind? I'll give you just a moment to think about that. Oh boy, look at that. <clears throat> when, I, when I ask this question, when I'm giving tours at SF MoMA, we're usually standing in front of a Matisse portrait. I don't know if you've ever seen the lady with a hat, Femme au Chapeau, very, very famous portrait. And we talk about how that's such a modern portrait and had such a departure from what we expected. And I always ask people, what's the portrait they think most of? And thank you for falling into the pit. The, the, the first thing I heard, I, someone else may have been said, lady with pearl earring, I don't know. But I heard mostly the, the Mona Lisa. And we're gonna talk about this particular portrait, and in, in particular about Leonardo da Vinci and what made him such a great artist, and why, I don't know, a portrait that you might just walk by really, really quickly has managed to stay in our brains. Why so many people want to look at this? If you go to the Louvre in Paris, why there's a line of people waiting to take a picture, or maybe worse, take a picture with the portrait? I, I, I don't know. 
but we're going to talk a lot about this painting, but we're going to talk about a lot of other things as well. For example, that portrait, is it accurate? If you saw Mona Lisa walking down the street, would you recognize her? Because there are some people who think, no, those aren't accurate portraits. This is an accurate portrait. And what are we looking at here? It's DNA sequencing. And now there's a whole market of people. You send them a sample, of, let's say, of hair or you know, a tongue swab. And then they'll send you a portrait that looks like this, you know? And, just thinking, you know, as you're walking up the stairs, you can put all the different DNA samples of your family and your friends can say, oh, I see the family resemblance, lovely. <laughs> I don't know, that might be our future. I'm not really sure. But it's an interesting idea. And then we're gonna look at this artistically. Does this work for you on an aesthetic basis? No, I hear a very strong no. Anyone like this? Would anyone put this up on the wall? Ah, who knows? And it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. We're going to look at all kinds of things that you're going to look at this and say, oh, God, that's horrible. But we're going to talk about why you feel so strongly about that, why we're looking at it in the first place, why portraits are important. Are portraits important today? Well, I would guess that most of us still drive cars. So you've got a portrait in your wallet, don't you? It may not be a very good portrait, but it's a portrait. And we're going to look... <clears throat> at why portraits came about. And we're gonna start with some of the earliest portraits. By the way, this is not the earliest portrait, but we're gonna talk about why people would put a portrait of someone on a tomb, which by definition would never be seen by us until we dig it up, of course. We're also gonna look at the rules of portraiture. Certainly, in centuries past, portraits had to pass a certain muster. You had to have things at a certain distance, at a certain angle. And then we're going to look at how people broke those rules. So I want you to look at this for a second, and I'm going to guess that many of you looked at and said, oh, that poor looking guy. But I want you to look a little bit more closely at this portrait. Anyone familiar with Archimboldo? Yeah, so he did all these portraits using fruits, vegetables. So if you didn't realize that, don't worry. In the course, I'll give you a nice blow-up so you'll get a, a good look at all the little different features that are, that are shown on this portrait. But if you kind of close and, you know, kind of wince your eyes a little bit, you'll see it really does look like a person, doesn't it? <clears throat> we'll look at stories and symbols in portraiture. There's so many things that you look at at face value, you think, okay, yeah, nice. But why did that artist put a skull in there? You'll have to take the course to find out. Why did, I don't know if this has a pointer, but does everyone see this little doggy down here? Yeah, why is there a dog in this portrait? What does a dog mean in literature and in the history of art? What does dog, a dog represent? fidelity. So this is a marriage portrait, and there's a dog here, and I'm going to show you a modern, modern isn't within a hundred years, a modern take on this portrait where the dog is deliberately left out. I'm not going to tell you what that is. You're going to have to take the course, because I can't give it all away for free on the first day, right? You'll also notice that if you look very carefully, and again, you'll have to wait for the course to see the blow, but there's actually a self-portrait in here as well. And we're going to talk, I, I really love self-portraits. I always feel like I can walk into a portrait gallery and I can tell you exactly which ones are the self-portraits. To me, they're usually the most psychologically interesting. And we'll talk about the reasons why that might be. But we're going to talk about certain people who have done portraits over and over and over again. And a great example is Rembrandt right here. And you could see him on the left as a very young man. And then you can see him through the periods of his life, and you can see how those things have changed in his portraits. It's not just, just that he's showing us the aging process. He's showing us many other things, and we'll take a look at that. We're also, again, I took, taught, taught, taught that course in photography. Well, photography is just as important in portraiture, isn't it? And I don't know if you, the folks who took my class, remember Nadar. He was this brilliant Frenchman. And one of the things he did, he was the first person who did portraits in 360 degrees. So you'd be able to see 
everything about him. And actually, if you go to the web and look up Nadar 260, someone has very cleverly put it on a little video so you can, it rotates around and around and around. Well, we're, we're going to look at all manner of uh, photographic portraits and self-portraits. We're going to look how self-portraits have, uh, in this particular case, self-portraits have, have changed over the years. I want you to really look carefully at the four examples that I've given here. This is a self-portrait of a Japanese man. This is a gentleman named Moramura. And one of the things that he's famous for is putting himself in either paintings or photographs. So here we have someone not only gender bending, but ethnic bending, if that's a word. So it's a really interesting concept. I, I, I don't know if you recognize this. Do you know who this is in the lower left here? It's Casablanca, so it's supposed to be Ingrid Bergman. Does everyone know that painting in the top left? That's a Manet painting that he's done. Here's a Goya. I think you probably know Frida, Frida Kahlo. And so he's really clever in the way that he does portraits. But we'll look at other people and how they do self-portraits as well. And we're going to look at how some people think in the box, as it were. But we're also going to look at selfies. And I don't know how many of you know this portrait, but this is a famous selfie. It's great. A photographer left his camera in the wild, and there were a bunch of these. I, I, I can't remember. I don't think it's a baboon. I can't remember what the type of monkey it is. But here, he so, sat there and took a series of self-portraits. And they're actually quite wonderful. Um, so we'll be exploring all that stuff. I, I hope you'll be able to come to the class. We're going to have a lot of fun. You know, if you don't like art, that's okay. You know, you don't have to like the stuff that we're going to talk about. Portraits tell us so much about history, about culture, about identity. There's so much more than just what you're seeing with your eyes. And we're going to have a lot of fun exploring that. So I, I hope I see you on Wednesday afternoon for that course. Thank you, Charlie. Okay, so how many of you are ready to laugh? <laughs> I find that no matter what state of mind people are in when they come into this gentleman's class, they leave feeling better than they started off. Uh, Martin Marshall has taught a number of classes with us dealing with various facets of comedy and he submitted several proposals, but when the committee looked at these, we decided that this one was, shall we say, topical and uh, rather current, and there was a lot of material that um, we thought would appeal to a large number of you, and he's always good for a laugh. Please join me in welcoming Martin Marshall. Well, good morning. Um, this is the class, and when it'll be, it'll be Thursday mornings. Um, and I'm very honored to be here back again teaching at Sonoma State. Uh, I, I have been asked to give a, a small advisory or warning that uh, this class contains political satire. It is not advised for people who are perfectly happy with the way things are going. For some, it may introduce indignation or pangs of consciousness or reassessment or accidental enlightenment. <laughs> and I looked up the statistics and uh, it's about 80%, 20% in Sonoma County according to the last general election. So. I restrict myself to addressing the 80% of you. The other 20%, uh, I'd suggest Babylon B website, which is the alt-rights uh, version of the, the Onion. Um, we won't get into those. What we will get into is John Stewart. And uh, for everyone else, it'll be a marvelous jaunt through about 17 years, really almost now the last 20 years, hosting The Daily Show uh, with Jon Stewart on Comedy Central. Uh, we will see Stephen Colbert 
and John Oliver and Samantha B and many, many others who will also raise their satirical heads. Um, and I do have an advisory that this course contains fake news and admits it, which is the difference of this class or this television series versus, say, let's say, I don't know, nightly news. Um, so what is this class about? We're going to be learning as much as we can in the time allowed about The Daily Show, The Colbert Report, and Last Week Tonight, which, by the way, has won the last three Oscars in its category with uh, John Oliver. Uh, we're going to have a few laughs along the way. So far, I can't say how many laughs people have generated in, um, in these classes, but in the 29 terms I've been teaching at Ali, I know that it's less than 650,000, and that's my real pay for doing these things. This is my retirement. <laughs> um, and uh, we're gonna understand, we're gonna acquire a slightly deeper understanding of our times and the process. Now, uh, there's a question of, well, <laughs> You know, who needs comedy anyway? Believe it or not, not every university thinks that a comedy course is a good idea. Uh, there was a guy named Dr. Madan Kataria in India. He's a co-discoverer of dopamine, uh, which uh, it turns out that when you laugh, dopamine is released into the brain. It is a neural transmitter. Uh, Dr. Madan Kateria was not only the co-discoverer co of dopamine, but he uh, did studies specifically on seniors, and he discovered that it has a greater effect on seniors. It resulted in a better sex life, better memory, better sleep, greater enjoyment of life, more vigor, and uh, did I mention a better sex life? Yeah, okay, good. So. We move on and say, well, what else about, what is this comedy? Why is this series different from all other series? It's one of those four questions that we ask each other on Passover. Um, <laughs> and we get to Freud's swimming pool. In 1905, Freud wrote a paper on laughter, and he noticed a difference between what he called tepid laughter and pointed laughter. And he discovered that uh, what he called pointed laughter had a much greater audience reaction to, uh, to the jokes than the tepid laughter. And I'd say, looking at today's comedy, about 98% of it is aimed at creating tepid laughter, a little chuckle sustained over a period of time, but not really rocking the boat. Well, the guys in my, and gals, in my uh, classes and courses, they rock the boat. Uh, so let's look at what's going on in uh, Freud's swimming pool. The swimming pool is the human subconscious and, oops. Ah, they're cheating, they, they show the, uh, the one ahead. Um, imagine that you get the water polo team to submerge uh, six water polo balls at various depths in the swimming pool. And at a given signal, they all release those, those uh, water polo balls and they float to the surface, but they don't just float to the surface, they actually uh, shoot up above the surface and the amount that they shoot up above the surface is proportional to how deeply they were submerged by the members of the water polo team. And if that swimming pool is actually the human subconscious. These water polo uh, balls being submerged correspond to all of the different little pieces of oppression that collect as bubbles inside our subconscious, which is to say somebody cuts you off at an intersection, maybe they're uh, a not so deep ball, but it's still in there. And somebody shoots your dog, and maybe that's uh, number four down there because that's affected you pretty deeply. You like that dog. Um, then a satirist comes along and ridicules that person who cut you off at the intersection or ridicules that person who shot your dog. It's not going to bring your dog back, but it relieves a certain amount of the oppression felt in that, that, that ball floats not only to the surface but above the surface producing profound and pointed laughter. That's 
Freud's point. And you apply it today and you get the average American <laughs> and the average American on comedy. Okay, so what are we going to do? Um, the presentational material is multifaceted. It is a definitely an audio-visual based class. There's a lot of clips and in between the clips you hear me talking and occasionally I'll raise a subject and somebody else talks, but mainly it's the clips and me talking, trying to guide you through this as the Sherpa, having taken 17 years of, of the Daily Show. <laughs> These things take at least 300 hours to put together and boiled it down to the 10 hours that you will see there. And you will see all of those folks. We'll, plus, we'll extend a little bit into John Oliver uh, uh, towards the end, because he's what's happening today. He's won the last three Oscars, as I mentioned. Uh, the, so there's clips, some class discussion, a little bit. Uh, and we'll cover these things. Now, I've, I've uh, printed out a certain number of these things that are basically the, uh, the handouts of this PowerPoint. And you'll find them on the table there. So if you want the details that I gloss over here, just grab one of these things and you could read all about it on your way home. Um, we'll cover uh, a different number of subjects. The various politicians. Uh, Glenn Beck, who's he? Uh, <laughs> and clip subjects, the power brokers. You remember J.P. Morgan and, and Goldman Sachs and the NRA? Uh, and the Koch brothers and AIG, those sort of folks, uh, and uh, quite a number of issues. So come join me. We're going to have a lot of fun and rock the boat. Thank you, Martin. Okay, so this next class is a bit of a departure, and I wanted to share with you how it came to be. Um, we had a wonderful student in the program by the name of Judge Lasky. How many of you knew him? A few of you. So um, his wife uh, and several colleagues of hers have gotten involved in a powerful movement that talks about end-of-life conversations. And they have put together events and uh, educational programming in several cities around the country. And this course was an outgrowth of some of that and will actually culminate in a performance at the Green Music Center. But you will be the ben beneficiaries of six different presenters, at least, in the context of six weeks, who are all experts uh, in end of life in one way or another. And we're delighted to have spearheading this someone who is new to the program, who I'd like to introduce to you today and let her tell you a little bit more about this remarkable class. So please join me in welcoming Red Wing Kazar. Thank you. Oh, is this okay? Hello, hello? Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, so how many of you believe in death after life? A few. Okay, that, that's good. We're off to a good start. Um, so it is pretty clear that the world death rate is holding steady at 100%. None of us gets out of here alive. And yet we do live in a culture where nobody wants to talk about it. Uh, this is a dear friend of mine who died three years ago who did this mural that says everything takes longer than you think it should or thought it would, except for life. This is one way that people die. This is another way that people die living on their land out in Sonoma County, or this happened to be in Mendocino County. Um, living life fully until the very end. So this topic of palliative care and end-of-life care, as I said, is something that we're still reticent to talk about in this culture. Although it has changed a lot over the last 20, 30 years since I've been a nurse working in this field, 
You know, it didn't used to be that the New York Times had a whole section on death and dying. It didn't used to be that you would see blogs and articles and internet videos about issues of end of life care. We didn't talk about it at all, which is partly the problem. You know, it's uh, many of us who do a lot of advanced care planning have the line that if we don't know your wishes, how are we going to follow them? So this class is really going to be about normalizing the conversation about the fact that none of us gets out of here alive. So the first class on September 12th is going to be this incredible panel discussion um, with experts in the field, mostly from Sonoma County, about what is palliative care? What does that mean? Um, this is a picture, um, well, the, the cartoon that says, there's no way I can tell you this, so I'm sending you to someone who can. Most physicians don't feel comfortable talking about serious illness and crises in people's health care. So they send you to someone like this who is a palliative care physician who is able to communicate and really help you and your loved ones understand what is going on. So it'll be an opportunity to hear experts in the field and also to ask questions. All of the classes in this series are going to be interactive and uh, full of audience participation and questions. The second class is an uh, Academy An Award nominated film called Endgame, which mostly uh, takes place at UCSF and a little bit at Zen Hospice Project in San Francisco. Um, it's an amazing film if you haven't seen it. And then we have two incredible uh, palliative care physicians who are going to lead the discussion at the end of the film. Doug Wilson, who's the director of palliative care over in the valley at Queen of the Valley, and Lael Duncan, who is a palliative care doctor and consultant um, and is an expert on the End of Life Option Act, which probably people have heard of and have questions about. Um, advanced care planning with people who have a dementia diagnosis will be presented by Dr. Katherine Madison, who's an expert in dementia care. She works at Sutter at CPMC in San Francisco. And she will talk about these issues, which <sighs> sadly affect many more of us than we want wish. Um, the statistics tell us that in our baby boomer generation, once we hit 80, 50% of us will have some kind of dementia. That's a little bit of a scary number to think that one out of two of us is not going to know the way out of the auditorium at some point. So these are things to learn, to understand, and to be able to help not only ourselves, but our families and our loved ones. Um, session four, another amazing film that did win an award, uh, Jessica Zitter's Ex um, Extremis which is a film done at Highland Hospital in Oakland that touches on the very critical issues of what happens in an emergency room and then in a hospital when someone has a, is at the end of life and all of the family issues that come up. It's focused on an African-American family. It's at Highland Hospital in Oakland. Um, Jessica Zitter is both an emergency room doctor and a palliative care doctor. Her new book, Extreme Measures, um, she will talk about that as well. Um, she writes a lot for the New York Times about these issues, and she's very articulate and very funny. Um, and she and Carla Fracchia, who is the palliative care doctor here at Kaiser in Santa Rosa, and myself as a palliative care nurse at UCSF, will lead the discussion after that. Um, on October 10th, Jesse, uh, Jesse, Jerry Grace Lyons, who started um, Final Passages, teaching people how what it means to take care of our families and our friends on our own, um, creating home funerals, helping people create rituals about death and dying that are meaningful to them and their families. You know, the in the 1950s, the funeral industry came along and started taking death care away from our families. Um, sort of at the same time as medical technology started medicalizing death and dying. You know, for hundreds and thousands of years, people died. And their friends and their families and their loved ones took care of them, mostly at home. 
And the process was much more understood because people were part of it. People watched it happen. It was more accepted as part of life. Um, so there's this whole movement that kind of started in the 1990s about creating home and family funerals where people are educated about the fact that you don't actually need um, a funeral home to help you with dealing with your person at the end of life. But Jerry has an amazing set of stories, an amazing slideshow about the work that she's done for 25 plus years. She's been one of the leaders in the United States helping people understand the importance of reclaiming end of life rituals for ourselves and our loved ones. And the last session on Oxo October 17th will be presented by the Sonoma County My Care, My Plan, and it will be about doing advanced care planning in a meaningful way. You know, a lot of us like say, okay, oh yeah, I did that 15 or 20 years ago with my lawyer, it's all taken care of. But what's critical about advanced care planning is reviewing it regularly and making sure that these documents they are legal documents, but that they also represent who we are, how we've lived our lives, what our values are. Um, we need to make them living documents so that when we're in a situation where we can't speak for ourselves, the healthcare system understands a little more about who we are and why we would want the treatment that we want when we're seriously ill or at the end of life. So this session is gonna go over what it means to make meaningful advanced care care direct directives and also give people an opportunity to start to work on their own. And as, um, as Karen mentioned, this six week course is going to culminate in this amazing, amazing uh, theater production from the Theater of War, which is a theater company from New York directed and founded by Brian Dorries. It's called Theater of War because Brian was a philosopher um, in college and a dramatist. And he studied Greek theater and realized how much impact Greek theater had on the audience in Greek way back when, in Greece way back when. And he started using the um, Greek tragedies and dramatic readings of short portions of Greek tragedies with veterans regarding issues of war. And he would get hundreds and hundreds of veterans all over the world having conversations about what it felt like to them to be soldiers, to be involved in war. And they were able to express things that they had never expressed before. So he has expanded his repertoire and he has a couple of productions specifically about end of life that are dramatic readings of Greek tragedies. They're short, they're about 30 or 40 minutes incredibly dramatic readings. I produced this at the Castro Theater last year. Um, we had a thousand people there riveted to their seats, um, partly because two of the actors, David Strathern and Francis McDormand were there. David Strathern is definitely gonna be at this performance and we're keeping our fingers crossed that Francis McDormand will also be one of the actors, but all of his actors are incredible. And they do this very powerful dramatic reading and then there's a short response from a community panel. And then Brian moderates an amazing community conversation about what came up for you when you saw this performance. And it is a powerful, powerful evening. Um, there are flyers outside on the table about this event. Um, we really hope that you come to the class as well as to this event, but please take the flyers, tell all of your friends about it. Because as Mary Oliver does tell us, to live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal. To hold it close to your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, let it go. We all have a lot to learn about this realm. But if you believe that you are a mortal being, this will be a very helpful class to come to. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.
So I'm not sure if we intentionally sandwiched end of life between comedy and wine, but somehow that's how it turned out. Um, so <laughs> we are going to end our presentations today with what we call our Ollie off season offering. Um, many of you had told us that between winter and spring or between fall and winter, you didn't know what to do with yourselves because there was no Ollie. So we've created what we call Ollie Off Season, which is a single class that bridges our regular terms. And in this case, Ollie Off Season will be in the Wine Spectator Learning Center. And uh, very appropriately, we were able to get Dan Berger to join us for a class on wine's amazing diversity in the Wine Spectator Learning Center. And as he'll share, there will be wine from his own collection. So please join me in welcoming Dan Berger. Wonderful to see as many people as we have. It's great. None of you have a wine glass in your hand. This is the wrong venue for that. But you will, if you take this class, it'll be your own glasses, because I'm not providing those. But you bring as many as you like, because there's going to be a lot of wine served. But the reason that I'm not going to dwell on what these classes are all about is that these classes are about everything. Wine is about history. It's about geography and about geology. It's about botany. It's about agriculture, viticulture. It's about people. It's about taste. Why is wine good for us physically? Why is it good for us emotionally? Why is it almost essential for aspects of culinary purpose? The whole idea of wine is to provide us a bit of pleasure, but it has so much more to give. And uh, a couple of things about the class before we get into the actual details of it. Number one, more lies have been told and more myths have been created about wine than just about anything except politics. In fact, maybe more. How about this one, for example? Somebody gives you a bottle of wine and it costs $250. You open it up and you don't like it. And neither do anybody else in your spectrum. What's going on here? The answer is about 99% of the wines that sell for $250 a bottle are absolutely undrinkable. Why are they $250? It has nothing to do with the quality of the liquid. It has to do with many, many other things that have nothing to do with viticulture, agriculture, or winemaking. What we're going to do is explore why you, for the most part, spend more money than you should be for wine that doesn't taste as good as it should, and why we all have been brainwashed to understand aspects of wine culture that have nothing to do with reality. It's the fake news of the culinary world. Let's go into this. Winemaking. What does it mean to you? This is a non-technical look. We're not going to go into acid and pH. and These are the terminologies that will be part of the lecture, but they will not, you don't have to take notes. We just learn them, learn the words, and learn how they apply to various aspects of winemaking. Um, the most important aspects are those two things in the middle there, the differences between the popular grape varieties. Why is a Cabernet different from a Zinfandel? What makes up the difference? Also, the cost associated with mass production versus boutique. How much how much does it cost for the liquid in a $250 bottle of wine? The liquid, just the liquid. Six dollars. Think about that one for a minute. And that's, the, that's at the high end. And then this last number here, buying and storing suggestions, that's a class that generally takes about 63 years to teach. So we won't go into the details, but we'll get some of it out of the way. Uh, 
Now we're going to go area to area. And I can't go into any detail here. You just take notes. Uh, this is the French. They invented it. They make the world believe they still own the patent. It's not true, but they do have a certain permanence, and that is due to the fact that all of the world's templates for the common grape varietals came out of France. So if you want the authenticity of French wine, you buy French. But don't spend a lot of money, and after this class, you won't, and you'll still get good va value. Okay. And this, and we're not going to go into all the details about how you pronounce Gewurztraminer and that sort of thing. Uh, but these are, this is the template that we're going to be used for a two-hour session. It's a, it's a class that probably ought to be taught over about 30 hours. We're going to try to get through it as much as we can with examples. This is my favorite class to teach, except for the one on the Southern Hemisphere, which I'll get to in a moment. This one is all about Italian wine. And what's really fascinating about Italian wine is that there are some 700 grape varieties that are being used to make table wine in Italy today. 700. We will not have an opportunity to try 700 in a class. We'll, we'll stick to two or three that really mean something. But the most important aspect of the Italian class is what did the Italian culture teach the Americans in terms of the development of our culture of wine? And I'll get to that when we get to the California session. Spain, Portugal, and Germany. Another class that could easily take up weeks, if not months. The aspects of this class that are most interesting are the fact that in each of these countries, one or two grape varietals dominate. And that is a really interesting compared to how France has been divided up into a jigsaw puzzle and how Italy has become so fractious. This is a wonderful class. It, real, it will go into some fascinating aspects of dry Riesling, which most people don't realize. Well, in fact, probably nobody in this room realizes. I drink more dry Riesling than anything else and have for oh, approximately 45 years. And there's still plenty of it out there <laughs> for all of us. The Southern Hemisphere, my second favorite class to teach, maybe the first. And the reason is that Australia and New Zealand are, this is the modern era. This is the modern era of wine, and everybody who knows anything about wine knows the good values, the great values. Right now, you're getting about a 25% discount on all New Zealand wines because their dollar is weak. We'll get into currency evaluations, and this class will explain why the best values in the world are coming from Australia and New Zealand. We're also going to look at Argentina, a little bit on Chile. Chile has got a, a future, but it hasn't really developed. And there have been three waves of effort. We're in the third wave now. It may take for another three to four more years before we ever see what Chile is prepared to do. And then South Africa, uh, there's a great story about the export director for the largest winery in South Africa who spoke no English. How did he expect to sell wine in the United States? I have no idea. Neither did he. <laughs> and now we get to the most difficult aspect of wine today, and that is California. Complicated, fascinating, the stories are endless, the people are fascinating, the people are incredible. There's a story that I will tell about how many people in this world tried to get the railroads, the United States, States railroad system, to reduce their rates of shipping goods for how many years? For tens and tens, for dozens of years, people tried to get the railroads to lower their rates. It took one individual who happened to be a vintner to put a gun to the head of the railroad trusts, and he broke the trust. The story has never been told outside of my own column because I discovered it in a long ago uh, archive, and uh, it's material that's never really been explained to anybody, but it's, but it, it's part of the lore of California that nobody knows about. Um, the future 
the big box stores versus shipping, for, that is to say direct to consumer. Other regions, we we're going to talk a little bit about Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Michigan, and New York, where the revolution is happening. And then I think a couple of additional things which are part of the, uh, uh, the entire lore of wine around the world, and that is some places in the world where you actually can visit and see wine in its natural state. The most natural wine occurred when a bunch of grapes fell off the vine on their own, fell into a, a hole in the ground just below the vine, and the natural yeasts that sit on the top of the grape skins created a fermentation. That happened thousands and thousands of years ago. How was that wine? Full of dirt? <laughs> Today's modern era, we have created an entire new culture of wine that we'll explore in some detail and with some really interesting ancient examples and some real modern new wines. I hope to see you on Friday mornings for breakfast. Thank you, Dan. For those of you who are a little dubious about drinking wine at 9.30, he's assured me he won't pour it until the break at 10.30. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. This was a tremendous turnout. Ollie is officially 18 years old, so we are coming of age, and I'm delighted to have all of you join us this fall and look forward to seeing you. Thank you very much for coming. Mm -hmm.